Welcome to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Delivered by DoorDash. Welcome to episode 144 of the DFO Rundown coming to you live at the conclusion of the 2022 NHL entry draft. And of course, uh, the DFO Rundown is brought to you by Three Ice. It's overtime all the time. Uh, led by six Hall of Famers, Grant Fuhrer, Larry Murphy, Guy Carboneau, John LeClaire, Joe Mullen, and Brian Trottier. Three Ice is hitting eight cities this summer, including uh, stops in uh, Canada, London, Ontario, July 16th. And uh, Quebec City on July 30th. You can get your tickets at 3ice.com. That's the number 3ice.com. I'm Jason Greger. Frank Saravalli is here. And uh, Frank, the uh, the draft, uh, man, that was a, a whirlwind. It was much quicker day two today. Now oh, it was back live in person. We needed that. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was a nice. A lot of hungover people in the building here. I talked to a few uh, people that may or may not have been on the draft floor that said they saw the sun come up this morning in Montreal. So, oh, wow. Uh, they put in a shift a- yesterday, last night in round one and overnight. Well, there's a few teams today, Frank, that um, in the first 100 picks, there were seven teams that owned 44 percent of those 100 picks. I tell you, you had Chicago and Arizona. The rebuilders. Yeah. Chicago and Arizona. Minnesota actually had five of them. They um, need them. Yeah. Because they got to get guys on entry level <laughs> contracts over the next three years. 100%. Um, let, let's get to some of the moves over the whole, uh, you know, the last uh, 48 hours that have occurred. Wh- which trade uh, either A, surprised you or did you like the best? Well, I think what surprised me the most was the Kirby Doc trade. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just doing some research and intel and homework on the Blackhawks and their situation over the last you know, a few days leading up to it and the Alex to trade that preceded it. My sense was they weren't very close on a doc trade. And then I think it materialized pretty quickly. Um, that one surprised me just because he is a bit younger. He's even 21. Than, yeah. He's a bit younger than to it, but I always wonder, and I don't have any Intel when I ask this, I'm, I'm purely just speculating when I say, what does Chicago know about his wrist and hand that, the Montreal Canadiens and everyone else don't like, maybe he doesn't have the opportunity to come back and be the player that we thought he would be uh, given that injury that he suffered. It was gruesome. If you remember yes. it, that the wrist was just totally, you know, disfigured. And that was a lot of surgical repair and very painful. So I don't know. Uh, I'm curious to see, but if he, if he does get to that level, he's a pretty talented guy. Oh, like a, young player like i saw a lot of people oh geez he's only a third liner i'm like he's 21 years of age most guys from his draft aren't even in the nhl for goodness sakes like it's uh it's too early uh you know montreal obviously they had to be creative they had to make another trade before that so they can get the 13th pick and you know they move roman off to to the new york islanders uh there didn't seem to be a lot of trust in roman off did there like even going back to their run to the final it just seemed like he was a guy that always was maybe on the outside looking in and I think purely just lacked confidence, like yeah. really good player, tons of skill that I think could blossom on Long Island and a team that needs desperately defensemen. They, they, they were trotting out two 40 year olds on their blue line last year on a nightly basis. Yeah. I think that that trade actually might've been the one that like Romanoff to the New York Islanders for the 13th pick is, is one that didn't have a lot of people talking uh, uh, very much about that. So I found uh, I found that was a, a little interesting because I'm with you. Romanoff, you know, at times you can be a little bit of a riverboat gambler, but lots of defensemen, str- uh, uh, Frank, can be. You almost be, called me uh, I know, well, oh because we're sitting God. there. It's because we got a headset on. I'm sitting right where I do my show all the time. It's Poor like I'm strutty, talking to my co-host. You just defaced his <laughs> reputation. But with Romanoff, when you watch him, he looks like a defenseman that, tries to do too much sometimes, right? Like he'll run out of position a little bit, but the, those are things that are fixable with more games. They just, it happens over time. So I actually like that deal for the Islanders. Yeah. I mean, look, they needed to get younger. Uh, they needed to get a little bit more mobile and they need bodies. Yes. Like they still have a little bit of a ways to go and they're still not there yet with Noah Dobson on a new deal. That's going to be expensive off of his 50 point season. So Dobson's going to get paid. I would think, unless they really try and play hardball and bridge him. I think it would make sense to go longer term. They went that way with Pellick. Um, so they've got Dobson that they need to take care of. Romanoff needs a new contract. And then they need someone else because 
you can't compete in that division unless you're six strong, maybe even deeper than that. No. Um, the, the other, uh, there's another trade, of course, and uh, you know, not a big name player at all, but uh, the M is free up cap space. Cap space is King. And uh, they move Zach Cass in at the cost of a, of a second and a third rounder, basically, because they, they dropped two spots or three, I guess in, in the draft. And they still got Reed Schaefer who they wanted anyway. So, um, you know, I, I look at a second and third uh, down the road and, so kind of expensive. It's it's kind of expensive. Um, when you look, I at, can tell you what was on the table. I think it was one extra pick, right? That in in most other years you probably if because I was looking at other just here you go you take our, this contract off of our hands and uh, we'll do this. Like remember Marlow for six mil was a first, right? Right, but I think the big complaint that fans had on draft night was you look at the Morazic trade. Both have both guys have two years left. Morazic was more expensive at 3.8 than Cassian's 3.2. And yet all the Leafs had to do was move from 25 to 38 and trade no additional picks. So, but the, and the that, difference is that Chicago doesn't have a goalie yes. and they need a goalie. Yeah. And this gives them some stability for two years. And Mrazic's probably not going to be that bad, even though they're not trying to be good. Um, so Chicago kind of solved a couple problems, not problems. They got into the first round again. That, the team that entered the draft with no first round picks left with three. And I'll give Davidson credit. He made a lot of moves. He was aggressive and it, not everyone necessarily will agree with the return that they got for Debrinket or the return that they got for Kirby doc. But if you trust your scouts, it could be a damn good return at the end of the day. If you pick well, seven, 13, 25, like, and that's the one thing about this draft that we don't know is the best player might be in that range, 13, 25, 20. Who knows? We don't know. No, no. Could I, be Brock Besser, or Kyle Connor, or could be anyone. Yeah, see, the, the reason I thought it was one extra pick, if you compare to the Morazic one, because Edmonton fell three spots in theirs, and it was 13 for Chicago, for Toronto and Chicago, right? They, what, 13 spots. So to me, that's the third rounder, is the difference from three to, sense. To, to 10, right? Um, but so what the Oilers had on the table previously was a number of deals where they wanted to take a player back. Yes. Um, I think one of those teams was Columbus. Um, I think I'm just trying to go through my, I don't have my notes in front of me and thinking what there were like three or four teams that were ready and willing to take on Zach Cassie. And I think Ottawa was one. I think they wanted to send Michael Delzato to Edmonton um, as part of that deal. So, you know, there was a number of things that were discussed that, didn't end up materializing and they felt like this was the best one to your point to get the guy that they thought would still be on the board with their first round pick that they previously had. And, uh, and then today, uh, Tony D'Angelo moved from uh, Caroline, another guy who was on your, your board to, uh, to Philadelphia and uh, hearing what he's going to be like, did now is the contract. I didn't see it's done. Is it's it a two five times mil? five, yeah. two times five. Uh, this is a 60 point defenseman. Oh, uh, coming home to Philly. Yeah. He'll run their power play for it's sure. South Jersey native, um, I think it's a great fit. Uh, I think the Canes were actually pretty sad and sour to lose him. They just realistically, I think it was a bit above what they wanted to spend. Um, and so they had to make the move and they got a lot for him. A second, third and fourth for a guy that you probably couldn't afford to keep is a lot, I think. Um, so they did well on that end. I think the other team that was in the mix for D'Angelo was Ottawa. And I think it got pretty close. And Ottawa has been a really interesting team to watch this in general. To bring it, and I think what a great fit he is. the 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 real question with the bring it, of course, is what does his production look like when he doesn't play on Patrick Kane's line? You know, you score forty goals twice, you've got the goods, but you're also playing with one of the best playmakers in the world, and maybe the you know, arguably a top five that the game has ever seen. Now you go to Ottawa, where you don't necessarily have that same skill, but you've still got a Tim Stutzla or, and some other guys that are like Josh you know, Norris. Yeah, that's certainly they got, on the raw. They're, they're, they're I think they have the ability to be a good team in the near future. Drake Batherson, DeBrincat, Kachuk, Formington. Norris, Stutzel, right? So there's our top five forwards. You, you know, mentioned Formington, uh, you know, and because Kachuk's more like Kachuk's a different body type. Of those, so they've got a different mix. Got it's not ed, just yeah. skill guys. Um, and Tyler Boucher, their ten overall pick um, during the pandemic, he's got that same sort of, you know, Kachuk style and edge to him. Um, there, I think they just need goaltending. 
And that's the, one of the big things they worked on here this weekend was trying to offload Matt Murray as, as quickly as and efficiently as they can. Two years times 6.25 left. It's going to be expensive to move. You know, you're talking like major sweeteners. I think what they're trying to do as a last resort is a buyout. Like they don't No, you don't as much as they'd out. save five million in real cash, which matters to a team like the Sens, frankly to any team and their bottom line. It'd be expensive. And so it, it was fascinating to see the other day that Matt Murray blocked the trade to Buffalo because that had a trickle down effect on everything. Yes. Buffalo was then involved in the Peter Morazic deal that ultimately he went to Chicago. Buffalo only has Craig Anderson and he's 41. See, Scott Wedgwood to me is the ideal fit for the, the Buffalo Wedgewall. Sabres. Like yeah, he would that. be, he would be ideal. Like he's somebody who can play for, I, I, I think he's ideal for a cap crunch team that needs a backup. Yeah. Oh, I think he's, that, a, that's why I think he's a better fit. And you're like, okay, this is a contending team that can be really good. And you just, throw him in for 20, 25, 30 nights a year. Yeah. And it's, and I think he has the potential to, to play even uh, to play better on that. Now, you know, I'd heard rumblings that uh, Dallas would like to keep him if they could and have him go with Ottinger as their tandem. But you know, they obviously got to get the Ottinger sign deal That's done. Expensive. Yeah. It'd be Goalies very expensive. are hard, especially coming out of RFA. Like, you know, I just think that, I don't know if there's a cautionary tale. Cause like the position is so hard to be consistent year over year, but like think back to Mackenzie Blackwood and the New Jersey Devils. Yep. Like two years ago, we were talking about Blackwood in the same tone, the same light that we are now with um, with Jake Ottinger. And all of a sudden, Blackwood has really struggled. They've got their tandem now. I'm told Vitek Vanacek and uh, Mackenzie Blackwood is going to be New Jersey's two guys. That's who they're going to be rolling into next season with. So um, that... Uh, because I think with Jake Ottinger, Frank, it's interesting. He, he had a 9-14 in the regular season. Decent, but he was all world in the postseason, right? Like uh, against Calgary, he was unbelievable uh, against them. And so I, I saw this one stat. I just want to throw not to interrupt you. Jake Ottinger's workload in one round was very close to equal to what Darcy Kemper saw in the <laughs> yeah. entire four round stretch yeah. for the Abs. No, seriously, yeah, they yeah. were like 25 shot attempts off yeah, or something like that. It's crazy. So, and, and that just, so I think sometimes people like if you're Ottinger's camp, of course you're going to want to use the, uh, by the way, Braden Holpe, unlikely to play, he's unlikely to play next season. His career may be over. Maybe over. Okay. It's a good little tidbit. And so I, I'm, I can see why Jim Neal and the stars are like, well, we like Ottinger, but of course his camp is going to want to try to cash in on his playoff performance. Right. But that's, it's only seven games. And I've always cautioned everybody. People will, you know what? We can go back through guy has a bad playoffs teams. Like, Oh, we don't like this guy. You trade him. And then guess what? The next five years, the guy's good in the playoffs because he's been a consistent score in the regular season. He just had one bad playoff year. It happens all the time. And but so what if he's eager Shesterkin like of that quality? Let's look, so at, look at the look at look the at, was, contract. That it's, would to me, I find bargoon. Right. But if, if you're Dallas, that's the that's it's great. You brought up because that to me is the example I would look at to say, hey, here's just Sturkin's numbers. Look at what they were when he signed his contract. I think you're similar. He signed a record deal. Shesterkin got the most ever for a goalie coming out of entry level. Yeah, but it's still only five point five and it's considered a deal. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's a little north of that. But yeah, I agree. It's like. They're looking at that now laughing. This yeah. guy finished in the, in the hard trophy voting third and, you know, won the Vezina. Are you kidding me? Five point whatever for the next 5.65 or 8.5 for the next three years. Like it's insane. Yeah. They're so well set up. Yeah. And now they don't have Georgiev who was traded to Colorado. What'd you make of that deal? So I like it from Colorado's perspective. It seemed a little expensive. I don't, I this is not the proper way to phrase it. It feels like Chicago or not Chicago, Colorado, excuse me. I don't know. It feels like there's a disconnect there. Like that was a high price to pay when you look back to like Nedeljkovic or someone that was traded last year. I don't think his numbers are any better than Nedeljkovic. He just has more track record. And they only got a third. Yeah. They, this was third, third, five, fifth. Yes. That's a lot. Um, for a guy that New York like literally was never, they were not qualifying. wasn't He wasn't coming back, so they didn't. I don't. I, the, there was lots of talk that uh, Georgiev was not a good temperament fit 
that he was sort of a problem child in New York. And to now kind of inject that in, maybe you just have strong enough leadership in yeah. Colorado, but to inject that in to pay him, I think on ice play him and what they're betting on Greg's is um, they're betting on the fact that their team's so good. They don't need gold hunting. Not, not anything more than average <laughs> because Look, I mean, look at their save percentage in the playoffs. They literally won a cup in spite of their goaltending. Kemper finished with the worst save percentage among goalies in 45 years to win a Stanley Cup. Yeah, it was. And then, so if you can do that, and then you don't, you're taking Kemper and Georgiev, and you're smashing them together for four or five million bucks, probably less than that. That's what you have to do if you're a team that you know is is trying to keep as many guys as you can. Uh, well, I think they've shown that. They're going to be a team that doesn't have to have a dominant goaltender to win the cup and be competitive. Just average. Yeah. And uh, I look at Darcy Kemper now. There's Darcy Kemper and there's Jack Campbell, right? Uh, they I would probably those one, are the two, two guys that right? Toronto is looking at. And uh, and Edmonton, I think, same thing, right? Billy Huso now has uh, has signed in Detroit. Three times 4.75 in Detroit. Um, also an interesting... I, li- I like him and Nadelkovic together. Also, it seemed like a high price to pay. For a pending UFA, a third round pick, you could have waited five days and got him for free. Yeah. Unless someone was ready to step up and pay that price. Who, yeah. Who what? I mean, who was matching that? Who was going to be giving up a third to get a guy's rights? That's a good point. Yeah. And like, it's well, also a very expensive contract, it feels like, for a guy that doesn't have 100 games played in the NHL. Yeah. I think what it is, it just shows you goaltending, man. Like you. There's not a lot of them, right? Like there's there's just not a lot of goaltenders out there. And Billy Huso, uh, definitely, what he did in St. Louis gave you belief that he could do it again. Now, now we got to see if he can or not. But so you uh, got Huso and Ned, and then you've got Sebastian Kosa coming, right? Yeah, and well, and they got Nedeljkovic, right? And, yeah, I said yeah, Ned Nedeljkovic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Ned and like Kosa to me, if you look at young goalies. And, and you look at just the amount of games. He hasn't played a ton of games in the Western League. I'm very curious to see what Detroit does with him, Frank. If, if Because to me, if he's not going to be your starter in the American League, you might want to keep him in junior where you know he's going to play 55 games. Well, yeah, I think what happens is a lot of those guys age out of junior and then they have to go start in the ECHL. And that's less than ideal. So I would say you probably just... Bring him back for another year. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what their full scope of their system looks like. Maybe you just send him back to junior if if he's not going to be that starter. Yeah. Uh, Jason Greger, Frank Saravalli with you. Now, Frank, uh, on the trade, you know, obviously Debrinkat was a huge name that went and Tony D'Angelo and some others. But I don't think we, we've seen in the past um, uh, the day after the week, like the Monday after the draft, there's some big deals that have, have occurred. Are you expecting more deals between now and Wednesday? <sighs> Yes. I mean, that's the short answer. I mean, what happens with what happens with JT Miller? I mean, that's one name. And I think the other big one that I'm watching is Patrick Kane. What happens with Patrick Kane? I mean, they're in a spot in Chicago where they've made it very clear that they're not going to be approaching those guys to say, are you willing to move on? Uh, but they are in a spot where Things are changing. It's going to be tougher than it was even the last few seasons. Patrick Kane has a ton of value. Um, And then you've got the Alex to Brinkett trade that you're taking his star winger off. That's, that's been piling up the goals for you. I think that changes the dynamic a bit. And I think Patrick Kane to this point, uh, I've been told is not sure what to do. Um, But I do think that there have been a few teams that have expressed interest this weekend to check in and say, what is going on with Patrick Kane? And I think that was a a big buzzword, big topic on the draft floor on day two. Last five years, there's only one player in the NHL who has more points than Patrick Kane. That's Connor McDavid. Um, Patrick Kane is still an elite, elite point producer. He's going to be for a long time. Oh, yeah. So... uh, Man, he 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 would be. I honestly, I would take Patrick Kane and I would put him at the top of the list. Uh, I put him ahead of Goudreau. I put him ahead of Forsberg. 
I put him at anybody. Well, yeah, well. All right. Like, yeah. uh, like Johnny Gaudreau just scored 115 points, right? Like Johnny Gaudreau is actually, he's actually, I think seventh most points in the last five years. Like he's a good player too. And he's younger. Yeah. But I think Patrick Kane is still uh pretty dominant, Frank. And, and that like a lot of teams I think would be willing to do it. But Chicago, when you look at what they took for Debrinkat and, and what they took for Kirby doc, you'd be like, geez, what are they going to take for Patrick Kane? Teams are probably thinking, man, I can get this guy for not very much. That, it'd be a lot. I think it, well, I, I don't, I don't so. even want to speculate on what the package might be, but I think there was, and I don't, here's the thing. Patrick Kane controls everything. And I think there's a very s- select group of markets where Patrick Kane would be interested in playing. And I'll leave it at that. Like where? Big cities in the U S of a, uh, he is an American. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, well, uh, I, I think I can deduct a few names uh, from we that. We won't play that game. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying it to leave anyone hanging. I just, I'm not comfortable yet in my reporting process to say where. Um, John Klingberg, we, we, you know, you had reported he's going to market. Mm-hmm. Unless something happens. Yes. Okay. Um, he's an interesting name out there. Uh, the other one that, uh, that y- you, Put out not a lot. What about what's going on with Mackenzie Weger? I haven't heard anything on Mackenzie Weger. He's got one more year left on his deal. They need to pay him. Um, I don't think they have any designs on trading him. I think there seem to be some. I don't know where the rumblings came from, but I don't. Like it doesn't make sense. They're trying to no. They're trying to extend him long term. Yeah, that's my understanding. Um, They just Florida had nothing going this weekend because they had no picks. Yeah. I think they tried to do a few different things. Um, a for effort, I guess, but nothing materialized. Now, uh, the, they so- got, they're trying to keep Ben Sherratt. They're trying to keep Mason Marchment and condolences to the Marchment oh, family. What a sad, That's sad awful. week this was here at the draft. Uh, Mush, just uh, NHL scout with the San Jose Sharks, 53. Can't... Uh, I just talked to a number of managers and and people throughout the game. They're just sick seeing the the fire trucks outside his hotel here in Montreal, and for you know Mason and his wife Kim and and Mason's siblings to get that call. Just can't uh, can't believe it. Well, I can tell you, I was 27 when my dad passed away from a heart attack at 56, and so uh, when, when I saw that story, um, it, it definitely I hit close to home. And I look at Mason Marchment, and I, when I when I spoke to Brian last. Uh, he just talked about how it was unreal for him to see his son in the NHL, right? And like to he, have a season. I'm so yeah. glad he got to see that breakout season yeah. to, you know, to see, you know, Mason Marchman's going to be getting paid. Like this is, this is, that's why this was also s- supposed to be such a big week for the Marchman family. Like he's hitting unrestricted free agency, finally broke through in his career. And, you know, he, you know, he's looking for Carter Verhage money. Oh, I, I, I think he might get it. No, I think he might. But I'm saying like that's, you know, for a guy that had fought and yes. scrapped and clawed for so long to 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 get to the NHL, to then have this type of year on a really good team, hit free agency. And now this, you know, six days before you make it to market, your dad gets to see you sign an incredible contract and he, he passes away. Yeah, it's just it's another example, though, for all those people who at times like we talked earlier about Kirby Doc and, uh, you know, Mason Martian's 27. There are so many players that don't really find their stride in the league till they're over 24 years of age. So many of them. Marty St. Louis to kick off the draft. It's a perfect reminder. This yeah. is the first NHL draft I've actually attended. <laughs> yeah. I mean, undrafted player, undrafted player. And just a reminder to everyone. Keep working. Oh, never. Uh, you definitely never want to give up on that. Really uh, cool to see, by the way, the very last pick, 225. Oh, man. I see it every year. Colorado. From- I, no, but he was in the oh, building. I, I know. And that that rarely happens. Well, did you see how many picks in the seventh round, the last 15 picks were in the building? Just a sigh of relief. Oh, and there is still. Can you imagine, and I've talked to some players that have gone through it yeah, so. and didn't get picked and were actually in the building. Uh, yeah. Well, there was at least 15 here today. That left? Yes. Oh, that, and that's what I thought. It's all I remember. Imagine I've talk- being a parent of one of those kids. Oh, you know what? And it, it, it's like anything. It's 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 just another uh, adversity that you have to overcome. Um, it it's doesn't be a tear filled car ride home for sure. And you know, it can be the motivation. So there's two ways to look at it. You either can get down on yourself or just say, you know what? Hey, I'm going to show some people. And you know, you look at the draft, especially like if if you're a 17 year old, 
age eligible player. And if you're not ranked in the top three rounds, I would always recommend don't come. Just for that, because once you get past round three, Frank, the the, the public boards and stuff, they're really it's a crapshoot. It's it's a complete crapshoot. And and nowadays, when you look at the draft, more and more, and I, is how many players who are plus one or plus two years from their original eligibility years? Oh, it's some close guys to, go through again and still don't get picked. Yeah, it's close to. Well, look at the uh, King out of Red Deer. Davidson was a WHL player of the year this year. He was draft plus two years, right? This is technically his third year of eligibility. And he went to Montreal. Uh, you had uh, Ben King from Red Deer. Same situation. It happens quite a bit. Uh, you look at uh, Mata the, that uh, went in the last round. There's lots of guys. He just turned 22 days ago. There was so I, I'm going to the last few drafts when I was crunching the numbers, it was close, Frank, to like 45 to 50 percent of the players were already on their second or third year of draft eligibility when they got taken. And I think that that's a reminder for a lot of people to not, um, you know, if you're not highly ranked, it's now, if you want to come here and, and see it and, and great, but um, be prepared. I, I'm, I'm sure it would be tough to have to walk out of that uh, arena oh. and, uh, and not get drafted. Doesn't mean anything really at this extent of your career, because you can get drafted the next year, depending on your age, you can sign as a free but agent. But the truth is if you're not in the first or second round anyway, like you're not going to be treated any differently really in any organization. No, but if you are a first round pick the rest of your career, you're going to get opportunities that other players simply don't. That's how it works. And it's not even necessarily a meritocracy. I hear players that were drafted later or lower or get traded and aren't property of the team that drafted them. They're like, I might as well be gum on this team shoe. Like they, there's an, there's a vested interest of management groups to see their pick succeed and they give them every opportunity to do so. Now, uh, speaking of another uh, trade that I think has a, a ripple down effect from people I've talked to today, I'm sure you have done the same. Uh, Luke Cunning goes from Nashville to, uh, to San Jose and uh, they get John Leonard from San Jose in a pick and, uh, you know, not a huge contract, but uh, to the people that I talked to, they felt that this was just another step and they think that the Preds and the, and Forsberg camp are, are getting closer. And they think that there, there's a deal that's going to be done between them before Wednesday. What do you hear? I haven't heard anything. Uh, I think there's a gap that can be bridged. Um, I just don't know if Nashville's going to bend on all the terms. Like they don't give, we talked about this. They don't give out no trades. They don't give out signing bonus largely. Mm hmm. Rare exceptions, like Roman Yossi is a rare exception. Um, it's it's funny how teams do this, though, because St. Louis Blues don't do that either. And then they buckled at the 11th hour with Alex Petrangelo, and he was like, yep, too late. Like, I'm, I'm going. And they were flabbergasted. They were like, we gave you everything you wanted. He said, yeah, but you jerked me around for how many months now? There's a whole part of that. And then, I don't know. I just think back to Calgary and Johnny Gaudreau and where that stands as we get closer to Wednesday. Man, it's an uncomfortable spot for them to be in. Ooh. I truly think he doesn't know. And I checked in with a few people today again. Calgary has no idea. They, they're leaving here with the most unsettling feeling. Going back to Calgary saying, well, what are we, what are we doing? We, we, what's up with Matthew Kachuk? What's going on with... Andrew Mangiapane, like we can't, we're paralyzed. We can't do anything until we have an answer. And if he wants to come back to Calgary, damn, he's done a, a really, he has a funny way of showing it. Well said when you, when you, you know, there's, there's kind of got to be a little bit of a love respect from both sides and you, uh, I'm sure they can get a deal done, but like outside of Steven Stamkos, I was trying to think ones who went to the wire and then it actually, they stayed with the team. That just, usually if it's this what are we, four days from free agency? Five? I guess it's five or it's Friday. Yeah. So five days from free agency that we actually had one uh, last year. Um, Mika, was it? No, it wasn't Rant. Was it Rantanen? Well, well, he was, was Rantanen was an RFA, wasn't he? Didn't he just sign an extension? So was it Landis Cog? What? It was. I think it was Landis Cog. It was right, right the night before free agency. It, it was like okay. he literally went to the last 15 minutes before the eighth year was off the table at midnight. And he signed right at the very end. Yeah. I'm just checking cap friendly for you guys right now. And he signed his, uh, his Go most recent bit. big extension on uh, July 27th, which was yeah, the day, so, the yeah, day before he, he signed. Right. It was Landis Cog. He went to the, he went to the wire. Yeah. And it was a seven. It, it, it doesn't happen all that often. No. And so you wonder, 
And, and what's interesting is when you, when you look at Landeskog's contract, Frank, there's no huge signing bonuses in it. He's got an no movement clause for the first four years, which is kind of standard, really, for a lot of guys now. If you're a big name free agent, getting a no movement clause isn't isn't completely out of this world. Um, but so there's there's no real big signing bonus. So, so in there. Here, here's where I think I think there's been a lot of reporting on Philip Forsberg and the president where they stand. I think the ask originally seemed to be overstated publicly. I believe they were asking sort of uh, low eights. And some people have said, well, the Preds are in low eights and the Forsberg camp is in the mid eights. I don't know. You add it all up. It's not like it's not really a lot of money. No. To, like you would think that with the impact player that he is with, you know, 42 goal season and 84 points. And and being a, a rare play driving winger, that he would, you'd get it done. But I, I don't know. Like I, I haven't had the greatest vibes from it. Like it, it's always sort of felt like it's been in a dark place between Forsberg and the Preds. Which, I, like, I don't really under, I can't understand why. When you look at how the organization, when the, you know, with Duchesne and and uh, Johansson and what they pay those guys, and honestly, Forsberg's been more productive. Well, that's that's the trouble that they got themselves in. Yeah, but but he's more productive, and if he's if he's only asking for slightly above them, that doesn't seem like a outlandish ask. I don't think so. Um, but that also means it's another player that you have making eight plus million dollars on a team that. That would be your fourth one. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's fair. But man, if that, well, Nashville will be in the exact same boat as Calgary. Cause if, if you lose them and like, the I don't know. The difference is Na- Calgary won a division title and Nashville is, I don't know what happens with that. Na- like I see, like I think Nashville for a team that was sort of like in that NHL murky middle this year was never really ever in the contender category or even close to it. They took them to the last couple of days of the season to lock in a playoff spot. It, it would be a pretty, pretty massive failure for the Preds to not bring Forsberg back. Well, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly because you would have been able to get a haul for him at the deadline. And now if he goes to market and he walks and you get nothing. Yeah. Calgary's in the same spot where he might, walk and you get nothing, but at least you had a team that was contending for the cup and there was no chance you were trading him because you were trying to keep him. The real screw up for Calgary, I guess, if you want to call it that, was not getting Johnny Gaudreau done last summer because he comes out and has a 115 point season and all of a sudden, you know, what could have cost you X is now costing you Y. Yeah, it's always if, a- even if you're able to keep him. Yeah, a little bit more for sure. Uh, before I get to Tyler Ramchuk, uh, we need to shout out the 2022 uh, Double IHF World Juniors. What a better way to cool off at the rink than during the first ever Summer World Juniors. Single, ga- single game tickets for the tournament are now on sale, starting at just 40 bucks. So uh, you can get to... Uh, your tickets, go and grab your sunglasses and go to the junior games coming to uh, Edmonton at the double IHF. Tyler Ramchuk, how you doing? I'm doing great. I had a uh, really, really good time at my first ever NHL draft. Never been to one before. And I feel like this one was like... This was going, a good one to be at. I was say, it's like going right into the deep end with it being in Montreal of all places and a home crowd with all the noise the Habs made. And the number one pick. It's the, probably never going to see one like that the, again. The first two hours of this draft considering where it was with, uh, as you mentioned, Frank, uh, who they took number one and the crowd not knowing who was going to go yeah. and the reaction when Slavkovsky went. So there's one. Then the Habs are making the trade, right? They get Kirby Doc and and it was actually two trades. So the crowd's on edge. They're like, what's our team doing? You couldn't have mastered better. And then they had another pick in the uh, first round. So you look at, at Montreal and the situation as probably the most exciting first two hours of a draft that I can recall there, a long time. Yeah. There's no place like Montreal. Like I, I know I tweeted that and I know that Toronto calls itself the center of the hockey universe and it's self-proclaimed in my opinion, like this place and there, the energy in this building, the fans and passion of this market. I truly, I don't think it's matched in this league. It's hard to argue that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's get into a new edition of buyer sell delivered by our friends at DoorDash. <laughs> Even though we are live in Montreal on the draft floor, still got the ding dong button going. That's important. Uh, 25% off, no delivery fees on your first order when you use the promo code Rundown DD. Let's start with this. We got news or reports, I should say, that Duncan Keith is retiring. Frank, you've reported it. Duncan Keith, first ballot hockey Hall of Famer. Buy or sell? Buy. Uh, 
three Stanley Cups, Conn Smythe. Really, what, you know, we had Kyle Davidson on, member of the pod, a, a few months back, and he said he started as a video intern the year that the Hawks first won their cup in 2010. And he said, I've never seen and still haven't seen to this point a player that's able to pass like Duncan Keith and the things that he was able to do with the puck. Uh, the Norris trophies, the con smite. I don't think it's really much of a question. No, I already tweeted it out. Uh, he, re- he will officially retire uh, this summer. So he's eligible for 2025. Mark my words. He's going to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And, and it kind of sucks when you're in the reporting space and you drop something like that out there. Cause it's, I truly believe it's the player's news to share, but in this case, there was so much connected to it with Edmonton and their business that they wanted to accomplish this weekend that there were a number of people that were on the case. I heard on Friday or Thursday, excuse me, that, um, that Keith was going to be retiring and couldn't quite nail it down. And there was this back and forth that, went went on because Duncan Keith was really uncomfortable with sticking the Blackhawks with a cap recapture penalty. And in the end, this was the cleanest way to do it. Yeah. Uh, up next winners and losers of the draft. I want to stick with the winners. I'm going to stay positive with the first overall pick two more picks before 33 and the big splash for Kirby doc. I'm going to say the halves are the big winners, even though it's obvious of the draft. Frankie Biner selling on that. Hard to argue against it. I think yeah, I'll buy it. I mean, I I can't really think of anyone. I think some yeah. other teams had good weekends. Like I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going. I'm going to Ottawa. I think you get to Brinkett. You get a two-time forty-goal score. You give up a seventh-round pick. A seventh-round pick might help Ottawa in the future. They, you know, they all their forwards we mentioned earlier are all under the age of twenty-four. Yeah. Right. So you got five legit top six forwards under the age of twenty-four. Um, I'll take Ottawa because I think they they needed they needed to make a splash. He fits in right well there. They're gonna. I, I like that move for them. At some point, it's time to stop picking and time to start trading those. Yeah. picks for players because we talked about this before the other thing with the sends is at some point they're not going to be able to convert all those picks to players because they don't have room mm-hmm. in their lineup for them so this was a great spot to do it uh mark andre Fleury going back to the wild there was a little bit of chatter i suppose about a the little? future of cam talbot a little a little uh bill garen with this quote though courtesy of michael russo of the athletic quote i don't have shit to do cam talbot's under contract george can say whatever the hell he wants my team's set right now and that's the way it goes we can have all the dis- discussions we want cam's a member of our team we really like cam and all we're trying to do is win Buy or sell on Cam Talbot being back with the Wild next year, Jason. I love Bill Garrett, man. Just, I don't have <laughs> shit to do. Oh, he's a classic. Uh, he's all, but that's how Bill played, man. That's his personality. He's not. Um, you know what? Mark Andre Fleury came out. I think Mark Andre Fleury, to his age, he doesn't want to play a ton. I shouldn't say want to. He knows that it's beneficial. You know what? That they may go a tandem, two and two kind of thing. So um, I, I think Cam Talbot likes to stay in Minnesota. I think what he'd like here, Frank, is a contract extension. More, Correct. more that I don't think it's about playing time. I just think it's about knowing, hey, okay, you know what? I don't want to have to move again. If uh, if you guys committed to Flurry, then why don't you commit to me and, and we go and we know what we're doing for the next few years? I think he was also upset that Mark Andre Flurry is making more than he is this year, and I think he's also upset about the position that he was thrust into, not in cap hit, in real dollars. He's making Mark Andre Flurry is making more this year, right? So that was a sticking point. Once an extension. Um, and the spot that he was in last year in the playoffs was really uncomfortable. Yeah. Mark Andre Fleury starts the first five playoff games. He falters. It's an elimination game six. Cam Talbot hasn't played in two plus weeks. And you're starting game six. Not kind of yeah. kind of unfair. All but right. I so I get the the I get where he's at. Um I don't think he has any leverage or leg to stand on. And I also think like this drama, like the, the wild don't need it. The reason they have big cap hits on their books as buyouts is because they wanted to be drama free. Yeah. So if Cam Talbot really wants to put up a fight, he could potentially find himself eventually in a really worse and more unenviable position, given the quote that you read from Bill Guerin. (laughs) All right, let's wrap it up. Have some fun with the points bet bonus question brought to you by our friends over at points bet Canada. We are looking, we are seeing the big draft board here in Montreal and Montreal at number one. Let's look ahead to 12 months from now. Just take a stab. Who, who do you think is going to be picking first next year, Frank? Chicago. like Easy choice. You, yeah. yeah, when you take those guys out of the lineup, and especially if you take Patrick Kane out. So if you take Kane out, you take Debrinkit out and Doc. 
plus whoever else they might move. They'd be, I think they're going to be in the running. I would say Arizona will be probably in the running again. Um, I think every, like a lot of other teams are, uh, Seattle is going to be in that mix too. Jay, who do you think? Well, it all comes down to who's lucky. Yeah, right? Who's going to win the lottery? Because I, th- I think the teams that you guys just mentioned uh, have a very good chance of, of, of competing to, uh, to finish 32nd and 31st and 30th. And that might just come down to, to who's lucky to win the lottery. It's rare that mm-hmm. the team that finishes dead last yeah. gets the first pick, um, you know, multiple years in a row. So I'm going to go and say Seattle. All right. I'm going to go with Arizona. So we'll split it up three ways there. Uh, so you mentioned you got to be lucky to win the lottery. Sometimes you're lucky to not win the lottery, like in the case of the Avs and Kale McCarr. Yes, 100%. At fourth overall. That's going to do it for another edition of Buy or Sell, delivered by our friends at DoorDash and live from the 2022 NHL Draft. Who's not to say Seattle? Like, they, they go to the fourth spot and they end up yep. with Shane Wright. Like, how do we know that he's not the best player in this draft? Oh, not at all. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah, you, um, you know, sometimes, like for Seattle to get Shane Wright, there's no pressure now on them they're just like oh hey man uh, here you come and everybody you know you saw kind of his stare he was pretty fired up and you know i like a little co- competitiveness you, you like that i thought that was cheesy yeah well you know what he's obviously he's he's 18 frank that's what i always remember and tell myself when i guy, get it but i think the big knock on him was like you don't have any fire you don't have compete they didn't like the way he played in the playoffs they felt like he didn't elevate his game and find the moment and have that sort of burn and that passion and just felt like an odd time to show it. Well, yeah. like, I don't know. I, I, I've seen the li- kind of remind. I don't know. Who knows? There's always weird things said on the draft floor. Remember Alexander Digg? Oh, no one's ever going to yeah, remember, no one's remember number, number two. two. Chris Pronger. Hello, Chris Pronger. <laughs> yeah, that one, How'd that work out for yeah, you? Yeah, that one uh, didn't work out uh, very well. But it's uh, you know, the one guy who moved up a lot. I think Flyer fans, if I look at a draft pick, that fits to the fan base. Cutter Goche in Philly. I think Flyer fans are going to love that guy. Absolutely love him. So uh, we'll see. And what about Isaac Howard? Like you wanted, <laughs> I'm the best looking guy here. It's a bold statement. It's a love bold it. statement to make. By the way, the first goalie drafted 102nd. Yeah, it wasn't a bit. Wasn't a big goalie class this year. So no, but interesting. Like, it's still the most important position. So I don't care where you find him, how long it takes, what it costs. Like. I'd be taking as many flyers on goalies as I could. Yeah. Shows you how difficult it is to find them. Well, fellas, it's been fun uh, at the uh, 2022 uh, NHL injury draft. That's uh, the DFO rundown brought to you by uh, three ice. And uh, we'll be back with uh, our regular uh, rotation uh, next week. Of course, right? the free agency is coming on uh, Wednesday is likely going to be a few more trades leading up to it based on past history. So it'll be fun. Get home safe. Ty and Frank, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Saravali and Gregor. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode. Delivered by DoorDash.